So when I was in my early teens, I was really into this girl that I was smitten over. You know, like the girl when you're a little kid, like she walks on the school bus and like you hear like the Lion King, that theme song playing when Yala and Simba are always like necking and cuddling up to each other. So that was like the girl for me where like, you know, Disney shit's coming on. So you could guess my age. But in any case, the more I liked her, the more I kind of started to get a little bit weird because she liked me too. So there I was with this girl, my Niala, that I was super into, like the first love, I'm a, I'm a little kid. And the more she expressed interest in me, the weirder I got, the stranger I got, the more insecure I got. And then eventually she was like, if this is the real you, I don't think that's really what I want. So you decide after you get that dagger in your chest, you've been so scarred by women, you never want to do that again. You're going to move to China and just become a monk. You know, poor little Alex. But that's when I first learned about this concept called upper limiting. And upper limiting comes from this author called Gay Hendricks. So I want to share some of Gay's advice on some of the ways we commonly upper limit ourselves, which is really self-sabotage when things are too good for us. Hey guys, Alex Hine, author of the book Master the Day. Now, one of the best ways to figure out where you self-sabotage is by doing journaling exercises. The first link in the description is for a free journaling worksheet. You're also going to get a weekly email on how I use journaling to totally reinvent my life. So you can check it out, the first link right there in the description to get started. So the first way you know you're up limiting in your life is that when things get amazing, you feel like something bad will happen or has to happen. So there is no better domain of life that you see this in than dating, where I've had that happen to myself. You know, I was way too into a girl, overzealous, overexcited, and I got weird. And so she should have dumped me. But that was something I had to work on. And I've coached many, many people, a lot of which have actually been women that have mentioned this same thing, where maybe before dating, they're talking about being so into this guy, you know, This is maybe this is the one, all this stuff, they're so excited. And sometimes it's the excitement paired with insecurity that really stirs up a lot of stuff for people. And then their personality changes to the point where it kind of turns the other person off or makes them feel uncomfortable. Behind this belief that whenever things get great, I feel anxious, which is so common, is the belief that I'm not good enough and I don't deserve this person all this money, this great job, uh, this house, all this abundance. You're really saying, hey universe, I don't deserve all this good shit to happen to me. It's sad, but it's really common. The second way you know you're upper limiting in your life is that you feel more comfortable with eh situations than with really, really amazing ones. You feel more comfortable dating a guy or a girl that's like, eh, I'm not feeling too many feelings, but she's pretty cool and all. Or he's a good guy, he's got a good job, you know. He's... But everything in your voice is saying, eh, they're all right. That's saying that you're terrified of dating someone on your level that could really stir up some stuff because you know they're good. You know they're a unicorn. You know they're in demand. And you're afraid that they could just leave you for somebody else. So you decide, I'm just going to settle course this is not a conscious thought subconscious thought i'm just gonna get this person that doesn't stir up too much stuff you know i'm gonna get the fifty thousand dollar job versus the hundred thousand dollar job i'm not even gonna apply for that one because you know that's a lot of pressure and a lot of demands and i can't deal with that shit that's too much so we settle for eh it's like all these articles that go around cosmopolitan magazine like you know he's a player when and like the second or third thing is always like he's attractive Right, because every good-looking human has sex with a hundred people a year, as if that makes any logical sense whatsoever. This is upper limiting in action. The third way you know you're upper limiting your life is that when you upgrade one part of your life a lot, like you get a career upgrade or a relationship upgrade, you drop the ball in another part of your life. So it could be someone who, like, they've been working so hard for this promotion, they got a huge job, double the salary, loaded with money now, and then they get sick, like really sick. 
like bedridden sick and they lose the job. You know, I knew this one woman who was a high performer in New York City. Uh, I don't know if she was an attorney or if she was in finance, but she would get these jobs paying her a quarter million dollar salary. But guess what happened? Every year she would get this illness and would be so burnt out she had to quit her job and was bedridden for weeks. Now, this was later diagnosed as Lyme disease, but what's crazy is she did that four times. This is not a 20-year-old. This is a 50-year-old woman. She did that five times over the last 10 years. I had seen it every single time. And after the third time, I was like, this is weird. Like, this is super weird. She went right back to the same scenario and then is bedridden and then went right back to the same scenario at a different job and is bedridden. It was very, very odd. But that's classic upper limiting. That's classic, I want this or I think I want this. We get it and we're like, Ugh. And then the illness is one way that it allows us to deal with uncomfortable feelings because then we can rest. The fourth thing is that you manifest illness to prevent you from dealing with uncomfortable emotions. So this is actually a real thing and is very, very fascinating. Especially people that tend to want care from other people. It's very, very common among like maybe more neurotic people or more hypochondriac people that they want that attention and the care that they may not get when they're healthy. You know, some children learn that mommy and daddy don't love me or pay attention until I'm sick. And I'm, mom, can you scratch my back? You know, but then the problem is they're 40 years old and they're still doing the same thing. I've seen it so many times, it's really, really funny. You also see it in relationships, where some people use the same childhood tactic of, you know, mommy only loves me when I'm a wounded bird, and then they're a grown-ass man, and when the girlfriend is not paying enough attention or the man's insecure, he'll, like, mope, and he'll be weird, even among people and friends. He'll just be, like, quiet and awkward and, like, snippy, and then he'll go back to his room early, hoping she'll come and be like, Oh, honey, what's wrong, little birdie? Do you need your widow back scratch? But it's not cool anymore when you're 40 years old, guys. That is another manifestation of that, this kind of babying. It's an attraction of either it could be I need rest, which is solo, and it's because we're not giving ourselves rest, or it could be a relationship or an emotional dynamic. The fifth way you might be upper limiting your life is that you blame, complain, are negative, or in general, act like a victim, and you blame the whole world for your life issues. And you know what this really says underneath it all? When we say, I can't get a good job because of the president, because of the economy, because of my industry, or all these women or men I date are always treating me so bad, what we're really saying is, I feel so uncomfortable with my life being awesome. Think about how awkward that is, and it's strange. But that's subconsciously what's going on. I feel more uncomfortable with success and abundance and a happiness and loving my life than I do with meh or at the worst level, just garbage life. Because it's like, it's like the devil you know versus the devil you don't. What's going to happen if I'm successful? What's going to happen if I meet that girl that's just like the best I've ever met? What's going to happen when I get a salary that's double what I have? We're terrified sometimes of success more than failure. And that's a human thing. It's understandable, but it's something worth spotting. Now, with all these upper limiting beliefs, the main thing is to just understand they are limitations we place subconsciously because we feel uncomfortable with how good life is getting. And if instead we have the intention that, you know what? What if life could continually get better every single year in all domains of life infinitely? That shouldn't be a scary thought. That should be an awesome thought. But if that brings up fear, that says where you are right now. So just have that intention. What if life could keep getting better and better every single year with no downturns, no crashes, no compensations, no self-sabotage? Because it often can. It doesn't mean there's not undulations and up and downs, but it can continually get better every single year. If you have that intention, You'll spot self-sabotage before it begins. Now, of course, check out that link below. Fill out that journaling worksheet to help spot self-sabotage in your own life and upgrade your life rapidly. You can also get an email every few days from me on how to use journaling to completely change your life. So check that out, the first link in the description, and then come check out my related videos right there and right there.